Welcome to the Dignity Dialogue with your host, Joe Kittinger. Hey everyone, Joe Kittinger, another Dignity Dialogue, and I am so excited to have with me today a dear friend, a dear mentor, a, uh, a partner in spreading dignity, uh, Tom Thibodeau. And Tom is the director of the Master's Program in Servant Leadership. He started it many years ago. Uh, I believe to this day it is still the only in-person uh, master's program that you can get in servant leadership in the subject. He is a fantastic storyteller. He's a beautiful family man with his wife Priscilla and their kids. And, and he's just like, he's like the godfather of servant leadership. He's like your grandpa or your trusted uncle. Tom, welcome to the show. Well, uh, thank you, Joe. It is a privilege to know you and to be your friend. Uh, one of the things that friends do is friends bring out the best in each other. And every time I'm with you, I just feel more human and much more alive. And I cannot be more excited than to come to Power Up again this year. But to have this time with you during a podcast, what a joy it is to be together. If you had to guess, Tom, how many folks have you taught in your illustrious career. And I think, what are you, 35 years into it? 30 years? Um, I'm starting my 40th year. Oh my goodness. Um, and and in, and during that time, I would imagine, um, let's say um, two or 300 students a year. Um, sometimes with graduate students, be 400 a, a year. So 400 times 40. 400 times 10 is 40. Thousand, right? Mm. Or four? Yeah, right. forty thousand. So, so, so four it's thousand. It, it's it, lots. It's, been, it, it's a it's a lot of people, and I think that one of the things that has to ha happen, I, I, on one of the images that I've just came across, and I enjoy this image so much. Altruistically, there's one thing that everyone on Earth does. What's that? All of us open doors for each other. Doesn't matter what culture you're in, or what economic status, where you live, it's human in our human nature to open doors for each other. A sign of welcome. We greet each other. What's rather interesting, when we open the door for somebody, we see them coming and we can see what's behind them. They cannot. They cannot see what they've just left. We can. Neither one of us can see clearly into the future, but when they cross the threshold, we have that moment of intersection. Human being to human being, opening doors for each other. I think that's the process of education. I think that's the process of leadership. I certainly think that's the process of families. Opening doors so that we can go into an uncharted future together. How important and significant that is. And when I open the door and somebody says, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, mm -hmm. with a sense of courtesy and politeness, what am I communicating to that moment? Dignity. Hello, fellow human beings. <laughs> We're on this journey together. Yeah. That's what we need to continue to emphasize. How important that is. It's not just strategic. It is essential today because of the lack of connection because of our over reliance on technology people are hungry to be present to the presence of the other in order to do that i have to be willing to kind of step back and evaluate my own self as to how present i'm being to other people instead of being distracted what is my ability to pay attention to the needs to the questions to the unasked questions isn't it wonderful, Joel? And I've seen you do this over and over again. You anticipate the needs of other people in your family and in the people that you work with. Anticipate what is it that they might need so that they can be developed and become their best self. Isn't that word develop a lovely question? I ask this of every one of my audiences right now. Can anybody remember taking a picture with a camera? And then what, what did you get? You would get negatives. <laughs> That's and, right. what did you, and what did you do with the negatives? Developed them. You developed an image. Out of the negatives, you, you draw forth 
a, a clear image. If that's yeah. what development is with other human beings. We, we, we pull forth what they did not even understand that they had. The potential, oftentimes, that it comes out of the negativity and the darkness, and you pull it forth. I just love that. Over and against an envelope where you're stuffing things in. So <laughs> ask yourself the question, what's more fun, packing up a package or receiving one and opening up, pulling out what has been sent to you? Yeah. So I just, I just I wanted to give this because I think what you're talking earlier is that there's so many negative images and we have to recover positive images, opening doors, developing other people. Now, folks who are, who are tuning into this, um, we have leadership at Lambeau coming up here on October 16th. I'm saying the year 2023 because, you know, these podcasts last forever. <laughs> You're not going to miss out on, on Tom's timeless wisdom as he shares it with us. So if you are listening to this prior to October 16th, 2023, we are doing Leadership at Lambeau, the power-up event of which Tom is going to be there. And uh, a day-long time to rejuvenate yourself, to focus on you, uh, to sit back and realize the importance of great leadership, and just... You get a little better than you are today. It's not you're not competing against others. You're just reflecting on you. And and what I love, Tom, what you said earlier is just this idea of community and being together, like sharpening each other. You know, so you know the world has turned so much in this virtual, which is some greatness about virtual, right? We can have this conversation where we don't have to travel together, and and we can put it out to anyone. You know, in our uh, who cares about this message? That that's the beauty part. But you can't take away from heartbeats energizing a room uh, coming together in a, in a place like Lambo, a place that is, that represents, you know, the survival of the week, <laughs> right? The smallest team in the NFL uh, rising up to become the second most popular team as far as jerseys. I think Cowboys number one, I believe Green Bay's number two, if I'm not mistaken for just a stuff people love our story. And I think it represents, you know, your, the youth and you know, where we all started, not knowing really much, but just sticking up and showing up and, and going more and more into uh, trying to improve ourselves. And then pretty soon we, we become a little wiser and pretty soon we figure out our place and pretty soon our income rises and pretty soon we have all this, we have a houseboat on, on the river like you had when I visited you at the time. That was hilarious. I love that little it's, it's, it's really Americana of lacrosse area, folks. You've ever been to lacrosse, have these little river boats, and Tom used to have one and invite us on there for these philosophy talks with uh, so various people. It's just so delightful. We want to bring people back together. And I think these events, as much as they can be difficult to put on, um, tough to arrange, uh, people respond well. So I, I hope everyone can make it. Now, Tom, we talked about some topics you're going to be talking about. We're not going to totally unpack that now, but it, it'd be neat, I think, if you could kind of share just a high level of uh, the two sessions you'll be rep you'll be talking about. The first one is um, we titled Better Your Person, Better Your Leadership. <laughs> better Your Person, Better Your Leadership. Um, and that there's no doubt that when you better yourself, you better everyone around you. You have the power to create a flourishing culture in this high energy presentation. Tom, you're going to deliver that message. So do you want to talk just a little bit about the empathetic imagination that you're going to be really unpacking? Well, yes. Um, I, I learned this in my senior year of high school. When I was a senior in high school, a guy who graduated uh, uh, three three years ahead of me, uh, was playing football at Upper Iowa, made a tackle with his head down, snapped his spinal cord, and was a paraplegic. And my dad organized a, a fundraiser for this gentleman. Um, and he asked first uh, the bishop to contact Vince Lombardi, and Vince said, no, I'm really kind of busy right in the middle of the, of the, of the season in 1967. But then my father was able to contact Eric Parsegian, head coach at Notre Dame. Um, Eric Parsegian had a child with different abilities, a very compassionate man. Of course, at that point, one of the most highly profiled coaches in America. 
And he came and he shared this poem with us. Good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better best. Good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better best. And the understanding is that I can't lead people past where I am. So each and every day to be committed, deliberate, intentional about health and well-being, about my attitude, about the things that I think, about the things that I say, about the people that I relate to, the doors that I open, the courtesies that I exchange, that that emotional intelligence first begins with a high level of self-awareness. That high level of self-awareness then needs a high level of self-regulation. Not that I do whatever I want to do when I want to do it, but an understanding of self-discipline, knowing when to speak, knowing when to be silent, knowing to be direct, knowing when to be questioning. Now, how important that is that our level of self-awareness moves to a disciplined response to other human beings. And then what comes out of that is a deep sense of empathy. Not only understanding myself, but really beginning to understand how others live. As we talked earlier, I've just come from a prayer service and it ended with a mother telling us that her daughter took her own life. And she said, we need to remove the stigma of suicide. Mm -hmm. And I have to imagine what that must be like to lose your child. Mm. Empathetic imagination. I had to imagine yeah. what it was like for parents to have to go to Uvalde and identify their children by their shoes. I have to imagine what it's like for people of Ukraine today where children are returning to school in bomb shelters. I have to imagine what it's like for people in Green Bay or La Crosse lining up at a food pantry to get a bag of groceries for my kids because we don't have enough to eat. And when I say I can't imagine, what I'm saying to you is I don't care. I see. I can imagine. It's my empathetic imagination that allows me to have a relationship with people I do not even know. We experience this in the movies. We'd experience as a nation for Damar Hamlin. Mm. We experience every time there's a level of tragedy and people reach out to each other. We have this capacity and we need to nurture it. However, it comes out of a deep sense, a level of self-awareness. It comes out of a level of self-regulation because I cannot overreact. Overreaction is the opposite of reflection. And self-regulation says that I have to reflect all the time about my impact on the lives of other people. And then what it develops is this level of strength to make connections with complete strangers. Now, what's significant about this? We spend the majority of our lives in the company of strangers. You couldn't just do business with the people that you know. <laughs> so true. You can't just do business with the people that socialize with Danica. <laughs> no, you, no, but we, no, we, we always think that there's a small group of friends, and yet at the same time, it's in the company of strangers that our lives have this level of flourishing. Give you an example. What happened when the farmer mark, farmer's market outside of profit marketing closed down for two years? All that level of excitement where community members came together to buy fresh tomatoes. One more indication of how much God loves us, I tell you. <laughs> fresh tomatoes. And but no, really, they, it was a ghost town. People, yeah, exactly. And there's a sense of loneliness that pervaded. And now we're anxious to come back together and we get back together with a, in a company of strangers. And who knows what's going to take place. And yet what unites us is our common ability to imagine each other's lives, to see each other in a new way. How many of us have changed our attitude or opinion towards another person once we got to know 
that person well. Once I became aware of their life story, all of a sudden this person is no longer a stranger to me. This is somebody that I'd like to continue to develop a conversation with. Out of that conversation with comes a level of relationship. Out of that relationship comes a level of trust. And now we're doing business with each other because we do business with the people that we trust. That's right. And it starts with that wonderful gift of empathetic imagination. I love it. Imagine what it's like today for yeah. to try to teach in a school where there's no air conditioning all across the country. And all of a sudden you begin to recognize that, that empathetic imagination breaks down walls, builds bridges, and offers opportunity for us to move forward together. Biggest, uh, I mean, all the research, you know, you you know this too, we, this employee engagement, motivation, it's almost like this blanket engagement word that started to appear in the late 90s, like employee engagement, the big deal, and then all of a sudden COVID hit, and now it's like this this huge deal. Like it's now more relevant than ever, this idea of engagement. But I see the world uh, and I see industry try to find a logical solution to engagement. Well, let's do surveys and let's find this out and let's gather information. And there's no systems for opening doors. Matter of fact, when the employees are actually interviewed, they're saying it was about my paycheck before. Now it's about my development. That's what maybe jump in your brain. Like the research they've done. It used to be my paycheck. Now it's not. It's my development. It used to be you were my boss. Now you're my coach. And the research they've done for, for, for the new generation coming in. This is what they're seeking, right? Uh, it's not about my job. It's about who I am as a human being. Help me understand who I am. Going back to your developing in your, in your definition, developing the person, pulling out of them what is great. And shutting down this this uh, idea that I'm not good enough to receive that. Why do I get this favor? Why are you pouring into me like this? And I see it with young people. I see it saying, I don't deserve this. And, you know, for those who are faith-based, I say, well, we didn't deserve, you know, what, what Jesus did. We didn't deserve that, but he did it anyway. It's called unconditional love. You know, and that's, and that's, that's important. So, like you said... You're right. Kids, they do need help from their parents. You know, they do need a little bit of a boost, Some, you know, these young adults, because it has gotten much more complicated. And you know what? I got a boost. You know, I remember my, my folks gave $5,000 for my first house. Now, did that pay the full 20%? No, but it was a little boost that I just didn't have. You know, and they gave a little boost to all their kids just to help them buy that first house. Now the houses weren't 200,000 like they are nowadays, but it was that right. boost we need. It's okay to say, I may not deserve this, but unconditional love is saying, you don't need to deserve it. You already are deserving and it's my gift. So learn to say, thank you. It's okay to well, say, thank you. Well, exactly. And, and uh, then I think where we need to shift the conversation from being overwhelmed to pain, depressed and anxious what are the things that we need to do to create a sense of well-being, purpose, meaning in, in our lives? Gallup's recent poll, 41% of all workers today are caregivers, meaning they're taking care of people under the age of 18 or over the age of 18. 23% of the 41% are sandwich caregivers. This is what you were a couple of years ago. You were taking care of uh, people under the age of 18, and, and your father as he was aging. Out of that 23% of sandwich caregivers, 50% had admitted to suicidal ideation. It was just too much. So we, we have this understanding that in the workplace now, my time with you, the eight to 10 hours I might spend with you each day might be the best eight or 10 hours that I have because when I go home, I'm caring for a loved one, an elderly parent. I met a woman last week and she came up to me in tears and she said, you're so correct. I'm taking care of my mom. See, she lives in a rural community where there's no long-term care facilities. So she has her mom in an apartment. She's looking after her mom. She has a, soft, a son who's a sophomore in college and has just taken on um, the, the rights of her, of her nephew 
who has different abilities, who is being abused in a foster home. And, and she's a sixth grade teacher. She's beginning a new school year. Well, I think this is common throughout the society. Yeah. So many people are involved in the act of caregiving, just as an aside. In any one of those occupations right now where we have direct care of other human beings, CNAs, daycare providers. Well, I gave a speech to the National Association of Deputy Wardens who are going into work on the weekends and supervising. There are no substitute correctional officers. Mm. So wherever there is great human need, we cannot find enough people to meet those needs. So the people who are there on the front line are even working harder than going home. It's oftentimes with very little support to care for younger children or older parents. So how do we create a level of empathy? How about those of us who are given the position of being a leader or a manager? Do we understand the burdens that other people are carrying? What kind of culture then can we create so people can be effective and loved, where they can be both competent and compassion each and every day? And I think it begins by giving people dignity and worth, a sense of belonging, and meaningful work to do with feedback on a regular basis as to the contributions that they're making. You've simplified it because it is that simple. It can be that simple. Uh, we don't need to have complication in this, in this world of just being human, especially when we drop down our ego and we drop down our own uh, insecurities to say we can just have these conversations, have the courage to have these conversations. It's okay to go there. It's okay to be human when we're at work. Um, and, and we can create great things. We can have great outcomes. We can hit deadlines. We can do both, but not just focus on the result will come when you treat me like a human and you put me in the right place to be successful and you develop me. Successful, success will be the outcome of it. You know, and instead we've got to put success in the beginning in a way <laughs> and say, here's, here's, now go do it. This is it. What about coaching? What about mentoring? What about guidance? So I think, I think that's a really exciting message actually on, it doesn't have to be complicated, but I do believe Tom, because you and I have been seeing this now for many years, you far more than me, but now I, I now I, fi I wake up finding myself, I'm in the age going, holy cow, I've been studying this for nearly 20 years myself. <laughs> and yeah. I've just realized that. You know, we we over we overcomplicate it. And I've realized too that we need to almost have a system in place to bring dignity to the workplace because the old messages that I grew up with, with uh, leadership out there was, you know, all the stuff that makes up great leadership. But I have to admit, when I, once I had my own business, I had to put in systems to create dignity conversations, to have a monthly schedule with different individuals to make sure that they are doing okay. Not just the people that report to me, you know, we're a small business, but key, key stakeholders in my, in my business life, I suppose. Some people you know, are closer to me than others in any business, that's how it is. But do we take time to just sit back and ask the t you know, some questions? How are you doing? What can I do better for you? Uh, what am I unaware of? How can we, how can we sharpen each other? And, and I'm seeing encouragement with it, Tom. I mean, now out in the field, there are people putting systems together more than ever. Uh, there, I was with a colleague who um, is an independent dignified coach out in California. You're going to meet her, Michelle. She'll be at, she'll be at the uh, upcoming uh, Leadership at Lambo event, the Power Up. And, um, and she sat in on a, uh, a company conversation, a day-long, uh, I guess, being real, being human, and building culture together session with, I think there were 15 leaders. And afterwards, she said to me, I was terrified to show up because of the abuse I received when I used to be in the corporate world. And she said the beauty and the the cooperation and the, and the honest, respectful communication, she says, was shocking. You've given me total hope. There is total hope. And that's just not because of our organization helping them. We're supporting great leaders who came before them, the original owners who came before them, who believed in human dignity. You know, and those are the people we work with most time are folks not who don't know about it. They're the ones who are so aware of it, and they want to actually put a system together to keep the legacy going of their family because they believe in these fundamental 
you know, beliefs, but I do believe these things have to have a system because just be nice or just be whatever and, and oversimplifying it, it's so hard for people to take off and do anything with it. Well, you're absolutely correct. Now, I want to just reflect back to you. Um, when I first walked into profit marketing, probably 15 years ago, what was on the wall? The picture of each of your employees when they're under the age of five. You'll still find that. And what, what you reminded me of is, Tom, everyone we work with comes from a family. Everyone we work with was precious and loved at one point in the life of their family. Let's never forget who they are, whose they are, and who they may become. Seems so simple. And yet, why is that so highly neglected? It's so easy to focus on the tasks, the outcomes, short-term benefits, rather than understanding how do we create a culture, an organization, a system that is healthy for everyone. Your person, better your leadership. And then, Tom, you're going to be doing a breakout on a topic that, after our conversation, I named Good Grief, the Charlie Brown Solution. <laughs> Remember Charlie Brown? Always go, good grief. Good, 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 <laughs> yeah, good, yeah. good yeah. grief. Um, unleashing psychological safety by understanding that grief is a part of life. Just talk talk a little bit about that. Well, the, the understanding of, of, of grief is that I've been hurt, disillusioned, frustrated. All of us go through a process of attachment. And out of that level of attachment, there's the importance of bonding how important it is for a child if they do not have an attachment with a loving person in the first 90 days of their life. They are uh, very much inhibited in terms of later in their lives. Uh, we want to have some level of attachment, a level of belonging. And out of that comes a deeper sense of bonding. And in, in that level of bonding, as we start to grow and to trust, trust each other, but we realize that we cannot remain in the conf confines of one relationship and life changes for all of us. When you were, we're all born into a different family, I was the oldest of six. And then my brother Mark came along. And now I'm not just now I'm one of two. Then my sister Michelle, Michelle, my bell. Well, you can imagine where I, I slipped a three. And then Jamie came in only to be supplanted by Mike. And then Janice, little booty. <laughs> by that time, I'm 12 and I'm barely a blip on the imagination of my parents. <laughs> what happened to that kid so many years ago? We all, there's that level of bonding, but what happened? At some point, it breaks down. Yeah. Well, we're laughing about it right now, but we know that to be true. In every family and every relationship, things change. And in the midst of that change, there's a, there's a sense of hurt sometimes, there's a sense of disillusionment. Do they not care as much as they did for me at one point in my life? What happens right now in organizations that are merging? We knew what we had, but now we're a new group. What is that going to be like? Yeah. And in that midst of change, there's a sense of grief. Let's use the Green Bay Packers again. There was a grieving process. Aaron Rodgers had been one of us for 18 years. Now we think about it for just a moment. Is there a level of, of, of loyalty to the green and gold? I don't know if in, in, in Green Bay where they paint their fences, for God's <laughs> sake, they call it a love affair. I mean, you guys take it right over the top. But all of a sudden, all of us need groups that we can belong to. And yet at the same time, in every group, isn't there a level of disillusionment? Well, well there you, is. Well, I'll just tell you that we know that uh, God is a Packer fan. Um, because God worked, God sent us love. <laughs> <laughs> Rogers is replaced with love. So, yeah. you know, we know that we're going to have a great season. Yeah. Well, uh, 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 Jesus, Jesus loved Hondas. Yeah. He constantly met in one accord. <laughs> anyway. Um, wow. The, I, I know. But the understanding here is we're hungry for relationships, but at some point the relationship changes. And then there's a sense of loss or a sense of grief, and we don't talk about it. Yeah. In many situations, there's disenfranchised grief, grief that we don't even know how to talk about. I'll give you an example. We have still in this country to talk about the Vietnam War. You go to Washington, D.C., and there's the names on the wall 
but there's silence. Right now, we're finding that the terrible that Holocaust survivors, and there's very few left who are able to speak to groups, are all in their late 70s or early 80s or 90s. They waited this long to tell their story. There was it's disenfranchised grief. Early on, Joe, you and I both knew families where one of the family members died of AIDS. It's never talked about. The, the, today, the, the woman who with moral courage stood up and talked about suicide. Things we just would rather not talk about. So there's uh, this, un, this disenfranchised grief that needs to be talked about. Yeah. What happened during layoffs? And people never saw the people that they'd worked with again. What happened now in terms of when people had the great resignation? They're, you're working in, in person. Now you're working remote. You don't see each other. And now you'll never see each other again. There's a less, something has changed in the process. Well, we have to acknowledge grief. Denise Le Levertoff has a wonderful poem. She says, oh, grief. You're like a homeless dog who lives under my porch. I need to invite you in, give you your own dish and your own name, and to recognize that you are here to stay. <laughs> I just love, I love that. Grief. It's like a homeless dog. Um, I, I, I got I got a call from a company, and what had happened is that they had two coworkers who had died unexpectedly. One favorite coworker now, who's in stage four liver cancer. Another coworker where their daughter was killed in a car accident, all in the course of about three months, and they were grieving, but there was no way to talk about it because we haven't found the, 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 the language of grief and therefore we need to create rituals in which people are able to grieve. And I'll talk about this. The, the, the reverence that's shown during a military funeral is extraordinary. Why? For someone who's given this, their life for our country to, to be recognized in such a way, yeah. why is it that the Congressional Medal of Honor, it's a sense that sometimes often people have sacrificed given their own lives and need therefore to be recognized. We need to recognize grief and we do it in our rituals. We do it in the developing a level of, of reverence. Something has changed. We're different now. Yeah. And then what that leads to is once we acknowledge the grief in the relationship, it leads to forgiveness and forgiveness leads to reattachment. If you guys want to feel superhuman, come to leadership at Lambeau. Come and meet Tom and uh, be inspired. Tom, I'm always super inspired by you. You're like the, I always call you the, the godfather of, of servant leadership for sure in Wisconsin. And if not, maybe the United States now. <laughs> you are just an amazing man with amazing stories that help people think, you know, and, and feel safe in your presence. And, uh, and I want, people to feel they're going to feel that again this year and so uh that's i'm so excited for you to be a part of our of our group again so i just want to thank you in advance for coming i look forward to having dinner with you the night before <laughs> and rekindling and i don't know much rekindling but just stoking up our fire together again because it's such a pleasure to work with you and i want to thank you for being on our podcast so that folks who do not know you or haven't met you can feel your sincerity, your warmth, your wisdom, and your kindness, and your goodness. So thank you. Well, Joy, it's, it's mutual. And friendship is mutually benevol benevolent. And all these years, you and I have been benevolent. We've wished each other and our families, our wives and our children, our parents, we've wished them well carrying on a tradition and a legacy that you and I have been given by people who have loved much. We are stewards of a legacy, not our own. And with humility and grace, dignity and joy, we will share that with everyone who shows up and at Lambeau for the Power Up event. Awesome. That sounds like a plan. For everyone watching, thank you for tuning in. And hopefully we'll see you at Lambeau. This has been the Dignity Dialogue with Joe Kittinger. Talk at you later.